So good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome uh, to the Atlantic Council. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. My name is Daniel Chu. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Brent Scowcroft uh, Center on International uh, Security, and it is my pleasure to welcome to you uh, to this event uh, where we're going to talk about uh, implications and perceptions on the upcoming Taiwan uh, elections. This is part of our Cross Strait series uh, at the Scowcroft Center. Uh, part of our Asia Security Initiative and is sponsored by the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representatives Office, uh, or TECRO. Uh, recently, I led a delegation to Taiwan uh, on behalf of the Atlantic Council with uh, TECRO. And we heard a lot about the upcoming uh, elections in Taiwan, a lot of uh, interesting trends and implications of the current uh, polling there, uh, and a lot of interesting concerns about issues that are being raised uh, with the prospective uh, outcome of this particular election. Coming back to Washington, even in the months since that trip, I've heard little or nothing uh, on this. So we thought uh, it was not only extremely important to, to raise this issue, but to talk about it from multiple uh, perspectives. So we've got a great panel here that's not only going to talk to us about what's going on with the Taiwan elections right now, what some of the key implications are, but some important perspectives. In particular, what does China think about uh, the trends uh, that are uh, evident in the current uh, uh, polls uh, for this? Uh, particular election, and what does the rest of the region, in particular Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia, think, uh, and what are the potential implications there? And then not surprisingly, given the expertise we have on the panel today, you'll also hear a lot about implications for U.S. policy uh, and interests in, in the region as well. The Taiwanese presidential elections, as some of you know, will be happening on the 16th of January in 2016, and it's increasingly drawing attention uh, in the region, even if not yet, uh, here in Washington, DP, uh, D.C. Uh, the DPP presidential candidate, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, uh, is predicted in pretty much all the polls uh, to be uh, the, out, uh, the victor in this particular election over the KMT uh, candidate. So the real question is, what are the implications given eight years of KMT rule and policy, particularly with regard to cross-strait uh, relations? The KMT has really emphasized its efforts uh, to stabilize relationships, uh, the relationship across uh, the strait. So how will the election affect cross-strait relations? KMT has also worked very hard on uh, defining a uh, more prominent role for itself with regard to uh, disputes in East China Sea and South China Sea. So again, a question of what some discontinuity uh, or continuity here might look like if there is a change uh, in party leadership. And then, of course, questions about Taiwan's defense policy as they think hard about not only their defense strategy for deterrence and security across the strait, uh, but more generally uh, in the region uh, as well. So the outcomes will be important and critical, not only for the region, but for uh, U.S. defense interests uh, in the region as well. And we have a panel here to really help uh, talk through uh, these different uh, aspects of it. Uh, first, we have Ms. Bonnie Glazer, who I suspect all of you know uh, as one of the uh, foremost experts on Taiwan and uh, issues in Taiwan. Uh, she is, of course, Senior Advisor for Asia and the Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic uh, and International Studies. Uh, and I won't go through the extensive list of publications and issues, but I think you all know uh, has uh, quite a track record on these particular uh, issues. Next to her is uh, Carla Freeman, who is Associate Director of the China Studies Program uh, and Associate Research Professor uh, and Executive Director of the SICE Foreign Policy Institute uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And Carla will in particular provide us with a perspective uh, from China. Uh, we have Meredith Miller with us, who is currently Vice President for Southeast Asia uh, at the Albright Stonebridge uh, Group. Uh, I met Meredith when she was working at the National Bureau for Asian Research, uh, and Meredith is by far one of the best experts on Southeast Asian uh, issues and perspectives, and we're very glad to have her here uh, with us as well. And then providing a perspective on, uh, from Northeast Asia is our own Bob Manning, who is, of course, Senior Fellow at the Scowcroft Center uh, for uh, Asian Security uh, Issues, uh, previously a number of different positions in the intelligence community and elsewhere, uh, looking at futures and Asia uh, issues, and, of course, uh, was once uh, Director of Asian Studies and Senior Fellow uh, at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. So we've got a very esteemed panel here to talk to you not only about the details and implications of the elections, but provide multiple sp perspectives, and here to really shepherd this particular conversation uh, and help tease out the important questions uh, is a good friend of mine, Nike Ching, who is uh, 
the State Department TV beat reporter for Voice of America's Mandarin service, has a very long uh, career in media uh, covering Capitol Hill, uh, as well as uh, as Washington bureau chief for the Broadcasting Corporation of China, uh, Taiwan's largest radio news network uh, for about six years. Uh, I think. So I'm going to hand it over to her to handle this particular conversation. We'll allow the panel uh, to uh, start with some discussion. And then, as usual, for our Cross Strait series, very much look forward uh, to having you all participate in the conversation as well. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Over to you. Excellent. Excellent. I don't think I can say it better than you. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys watched uh, Stephen Colbert last, last night, but he said that uh, as long as he has nine months to produce one hour live television program. He can do that forever. So I just talked to the council, they only use a few weeks and to put together this comprehensive panel of experts. So they can do this forever. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as munchkins and students are back to school, of course parents are back to work, right? So uh, today's seminar is just one of the th at least three seminars of the same topic, which is Tony's election, which explains that it's very newsy and it's very timely. So as a reporter, I won't give you 8,000 words. I would be quick and sweet. Mm -hmm. So here we have Bonnie Glazer, AKA Glai Yi, and he, uh, she will update us uh, the political uh, uh, situation in Taiwan and how would the potential outcomes affect the Taiwan politically, economically, and its foreign policy. So, Bonnie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nike, and uh, thanks to Dan and to the Atlanta Council. Uh, the community of people who pay close attention to Taiwan is small, uh, but I think we're all very passionate, and I'm gl very glad to see that the Atlanta Council has convened this panel today, and as some of you may know, uh, CSIS and Brookings will be holding an event next Monday. <laughs> so this is just the beginning of what I think is gonna be a longer conversation uh, going on over the next uh, several months in the run up to the election in Taiwan. And it's very important to understand what's at stake, who the players are, uh, what the implications are for the United States and for cross-strait relations that Carla will talk about. So I'll just try to be brief. I want to start by telling uh, those of you who may not know all the details about these candidates, just a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of each of them. Uh, so we start with uh, Tsai Ing-wen, who is the candidate for the DPP, a lawyer who studied uh, in the US and the UK. She served in the Lee dong hui administration. She was chief negotiator for Taiwan's entry into the World Trade Organization. Uh, under Chen Shui-bian's uh, administration, she headed the MAC. She joined the DPP um, relatively re recently in 2004, served as legislator, later became vice premier, uh, party of, uh, chair of the party, uh, and uh, was presidential candidate, as uh, probably you all know, in 2012, and was defeated. Hong Xiu-ju is the candidate for the KMT, and a very untraditional uh, KMT uh, candidate. Um, her father was actually a victim of political persecution during the white terror um, in Taiwan, which might make you think that she would actually not be so pro-KMT, uh, but indeed she is. Uh, she has been legislator, vice president of the Legislative UN, former deputy chair and deputy secretary general of the KMT. She has a very strong background in education uh, in area. She's a former teacher uh, and was officially nominated by the KMT on July 19th. And then, of course, we have the independent candidate, James Sung, and for those of us who've watched Taiwan politics and elections for a long time, this feels a little bit like a deja vu when James Sung ran in, uh, in 2000. He comes from a KMT military family, a long time traditional KMT politician, former governor of Taiwan province when that position used to exist, ran for president in 2000 as an independent, ran as the VP on the ticket uh, with KMT uh, chairman uh, Li and John in 2004 and ran again in 2012, uh, garnering 2.8% uh, of the vote. And he is uh, the founder and chair of the People's First Party. As Dan mentioned, uh, the polls do show uh, Tsai Ing-wen having a significant lead. So in the most recent polls that I've looked at over the last week, her lead uh, over uh, uh, James Sung it varies in, in all of the polls, ranges to something, something like an 18 to 25% margin. It's really quite significant. Hong Xiu-ju is really in a solid last place, coming in somewhere between 13 and 23%. Uh, percent. 
Uh, in my view, if all three remain in the race, if there's nobody who pulls out or there isn't a consolidation of the Sung Hong ticket, which some people were talking about last week, seems less likely now. Um, so if, if things remain as they are, I think that the chances of Tsai Ing-wen winning are really quite good this time. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, many of the uh, countries in the region, and including mainland China uh, in the United States, uh, are operating in the assumption almost now that, uh, that Tsai Ing-wen will be the next president of, of Taiwan. Something that I think is particularly important to pay attention to is what will happen in the legislative UN. For the first time, there really is a possibility that the DPP will gain a majority uh, in the LY. Not a sure thing, but would be a profound change in, in, in Taiwan's <coughs> politics, where the KMT has been in the majority for a very long time. Uh, so I want to talk about a few key trends in Taiwan's political environment. Uh, one is essentially growing dissatisfaction with what is seen as disappointing economic performance and uh, poor govern governance. Uh, so there have been issues with uh, Taiwan's declining economic competitiveness. There have been food safety scandals, uh, stagnant wages, soaring house prices. And of course, uh, President Ma ying poll ratings uh, have been pretty low. They've hovered for quite some time between 20 and 25 percent. Um, his disapproval rating um, has at times risen um, as high as 70 percent. Uh, the economic picture um, has not really been that bad, but going forward really may face some significant challenges. So if we look back the last three years, Taiwan has grown at 2.1%, 2.2%, 3.7% respectively over the last three years. Uh, I was just looking last night at the, um, uh, the uh, August uh, figures. You know, Exports just this past month uh, fell by almost 15% year on year. This is the seventh consecutive month of decline uh, in exports. Um, and, and this is, in a sense, not surprising. China's economy, the mainland, is slowing down. And, and Taiwan is going to bear the brunt of this, in part because 40% of its exports go to China, uh, but also because um, it has a lot of investment in, in China. And it's really inextricably um, connected uh, to the mainland uh, economically. Um, the other factor that has impinged on Taiwan's co uh, competitive edge is the uh, marginalization of Taiwan from the regional integration, economic integration process. So you take a country like South Korea, which produces many products that are comparable uh, to Taiwan's manufacturing, uh, and uh, South Korea has signed FTAs with the United States, with the European Union, with Canada, it's negotiating with Australia. Um, this has really, I think, raised some alarm bells uh, in, in Taiwan. So there's a lot of, there's growing concern uh, in Taiwan about what it should do to become part of this regional economic integration process that it has so far really been uh, marginalized from. A second trend that I would point to uh, that I think is very important in Taiwan's domestic um, uh, pol political milieu is um, the trend of the politicization of the youth. Um, the youth in many countries around the world um, uh, can be pretty ag agnostic and, and apolitical and apathetic. Uh, and, and in Taiwan, I think this is really, uh, to the extent that it was true in the past, just really fundamentally changed. Uh, we have seen, of course, beginning with the sunflower movement, issues in the Sunflower Movement was the opposition to the trade and services agreement with the mainland. And there were, of course, significant protests and occupation of the LY. More recently, we've seen protests which are seen as uh, pro-China and charged with whitewashing the author authoritarian period in Taiwan's history. So I think youth are going to have a very significant impact on this upcoming election. Um, one question, of course, is going to be turnout. Will they, will they come out and vote? Um, I think in our last election, and the particularly first uh, election that Obama was election, youth, youth was, was very, very important. And I think that it's going to be a very significant uh, factor in this upcoming election. The third um, uh, trend is I think there's greater consensus in Taiwan than there actually has been in the past about the cross-strait relationship. I don't want to exaggerate this. Taiwan is still divided. Uh, uh, there, is an, there is no um, firm consensus on what the relationship should be uh, going forward with the mainland. But I think that it's quite clear if you look at the polls that 
uh, a very small percentage favors reunification, and certainly not in the near term. The mainstream wants to have uh, cross-trade exchanges, stable relations, continued trade, um, and there is a growing sense of vulnerability over dependence economically uh, on Taiwan. Uh, there also is a widely held view that the mainland is blocking Taiwan from participating in more in the international community. Uh, so I, I see greater consensus than we have had uh, in the past uh, in Taiwan about what kind of relationship they should have uh, with the mainland. Very few really want reunification. A, a small but growing percentage want independence, although I don't think that people in Taiwan want to put their own security at risk in order to achieve that. So the status quo, of course, is what is supported by the vast majority of people. And then finally, um, on, the, on the issue of identity, a growing percentage of the uh, population in Taiwan self-describes as Taiwanese. Um, there was one poll in February this year that found 90% of the population considered themselves as Taiwanese. So let me just say a few things about the prospects um, for uh, a few issues that the United States really cares about regarding Taiwan's future. Um, one is certainly the um, the uh, uh, whether the cross-strait relationship will remain stable. Uh, this is something that the U.S. has, I think, an abiding interest in. Uh, so if there were to be a, a, a KMT president or if James Sung were elected, um, I think actually dramatic improvement in the cross-strait relationship would be unlikely, but I don't think that we would see major problems. They would both accept the 1992 consensus. If a future president in Taiwan were to push for a peace pact with the mainland, then I think if, if mishandled, that actually could cause major demonstrations in Taiwan and could be a problem uh, for, uh, for the United States, something that we would be concerned about. But that's the less likely scenario, since I have said Tsai Ing-wen is more likely uh, to be elected. And she has advocated maintaining the status quo, which includes sustaining the freedom and democracy of the people, um, in preserving peace and stability and upholding the will of the Taiwanese people. She spoke at CSIS in June, um, and she said that the status quo should be based on the existing ROC constitutional order and the accumulated outcomes of more than 20 years of cross-strait negotiations and interactions. That's actually a very interesting way to phrase uh, the definition of status quo, because the more than 20 years outcomes actually includes 1992 the talks that took place then, and their outcomes, even though she has not embraced the 1992 consensus, and I don't think will. If elected, I think Tsai would be very unlikely to pursue provocative policies uh, toward the mainland, though she is unlikely to embrace uh, one China. So whether cross-strait relations remain stable depend on that interaction between her policies and then the mainland's reaction. Uh, I think for the time being, Beijing has insisted consistently <laughs> that she accept the 1992 consensus, that, and particularly its core, that the two sides of the strait are part of one China. If she fails to, um, uh, to do so, officials have actually said um, privately that uh, China will close the door. It will end Cefe Rat's talks. It will, may even stop mainland tourists from visiting Taiwan and further squeeze Taiwan's international space. This would have very negative implications for U.S. interests, quite, quite frankly. I think the United States wants to see communication channels remain open um, and a pragmatic problem-solving relationship between the two sides of the strait. I would just end that part of my presentation by saying I don't think we've heard the bottom line from the mainland yet. We're going to hear more after the elections and, of course, after the inauguration. So there's a lot of time uh, for this uh, to, uh, to evolve. Um, uh, rather than going into, I, I was going to talk about Hong and, and Sung's policies towards the mainland, but I'll skip that in the interest uh, of time and just briefly touch on three other uh, issues that the United States has deep interests in. One is defense. Um, if the DPP wins, uh, it has put out some blue books with some interesting ideas on uh, defense policy going forward. That include an emphasis on development of dual-use technology, strengthening indigenous weapons manufacturing, which is actually already taking place in Taiwan, increased investment in defense industry, and a promise to increase defense spending to 3%. Um, those of us, of course, who have a memory of the past know that Chen Shui-bian also said that he would have a defense spending of 3%, and so did Ma Yingzhou. Um, I think it would be very difficult for any Taiwan president to get defense spending back up to 3%. But the fact is now it's almost 2%. And considering the threat that 
that Taiwan faces from the mainland, um, I would say uh, that it is too low. And it is often perceived, I think, in the United States as a reflection of the lack of determination of Taiwan to defend itself. That may be wrong, I'm not agreeing with that, but it sends a political message. Uh, and it, so it would, it would similarly send a more positive political message if Taiwan were to increase its uh, defense spending. Um, on the economic side, the US cares very much about Taiwan being prosperous, um, wants to see Taiwan more integrated into uh, the regional economy. Uh, the DPP has said that it would foster growth in the local market and reduce dependence on exports, liberalize the domestic market, transform Taiwan's industries. It has said that it would review the cross-strait trade and services uh, agreement and other cross-strait trade agreements to make sure they are being implemented as, uh, as promised. Um, DPP has said it will build economic partnerships with other countries. It often uses the, the phrase, the DPP will go from the world to China rather than from China to the world, um, and seek to join the TPP. A very ambitious agenda that, by the way, won't work unless Taiwan has good relations with the mainland. That's just a fact. Uh, but uh, the United States very much would like to see uh, Taiwan economically uh, prosperous. Um, not clear what the DPP would do about the pork and ractopamine issue, and that remains a problem in the US-Taiwan economic relationship. So finally, I'll just close by saying, um, uh, I think it's unlikely that uh, Tsai, Tsai Ing-wen has the intention to pursue provocative policies. <clears throat> if she were uh, to do so toward the mainland, um, it is possible that the uh, relationship with the United States would suffer as it did uh, under Chen Shui-bian. And, and that should certainly um, remain uh, on, on, on our minds. Uh, but I do think that Tsai Ing-wen is committed to preserve good ties with the, with the US and to try to strengthen Taiwan and to maintain stable relations uh, with the mainland. This is going to be a very, very difficult uh, task if, uh, if she wins. Uh, but I think Taiwan's future uh, is going to face many, many challenges and difficulties going forward, regardless of, uh, of who is uh, elected. And I'll stop there. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Thank you, Bonnie. So um, that was brilliant analysis on Tsai Ing-wen's uh, def definition of uh, the city's core. And I saw uh, from the audience there are uh, DPP representative, I'm sure, during the Q&A, there, there will be more follow-up um, on this issue. Um, so moving on, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Carla Freeman, mm -hmm. aka Fu Rui Zhen, mm -hmm. and she's going to uh, tell us about the uh, uh, implication of Taiwanese election to China, and then she will analyze from the Chinese perspective, mm -hmm. especially in two weeks, the state uh, the state visit of Chinese President mm -hmm. Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. Carla. Well, th well, thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here. Thank Dan and the Atlantic Council. Um, I tend to take a broad view of China's policy, and I see this as a very expert audience, so I hope you'll take my remarks as the start of our discussion. Uh, I'm going to focus on Taiwan's presidential elections. I'm not going to get into the legislative elections, and I'll uh, try to do that in about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, the 2016 elections uh, and Tsai's increasingly likely win are, uh, have injected some uh, new uncertainties into the cross-strait relationship. Uh, it's very unclear uh, how uh, the mainland is going to deal with a uh, Taiwan government led by a party that has not endorsed a core principle that has enabled cross -strait, the cross-strait relationship to uh, move ahead in, uh, under the Ma administration, uh, that is the, the 1992 consensus. So that's a, the big challenge here. Let me just give a few minutes uh, to three different questions by way of organizing my remarks and trying to try to hit a couple of key points. Um, first, I want to talk about what the main contours of Xi Jinping's policy have been uh, to date on, on Taiwan. And then uh, let me comment on whether, uh, based on uh, recent developments in particular, there's any indication that Beijing might be open to formulations other than the 1992 con consensus as it's been used in order to sustain uh, interactions, positive interactions with a DPP-led uh, 
government on the other side of the strait. And then finally, I'll engage in some uh, probably wild but brief speculation about how China might continue to pr pursue its reunification objectives with a Tsai uh, Ing-wen-led Taiwan. So first, what does uh, Xi's uh, Taiwan policy look like? Uh, Xi has been characteristically bold and assertive uh, in his Taiwan policy. I went from the time he came to office, his goal was to try to take the cross-strait relationship beyond uh, the expansion of economic ties in a new direction, uh, to include political links beyond, politi beyond party to party ties. And this was reflected early on in Xi's interactions with the, with the Taiwanese uh, the, uh, when he met with the Taiwan delegation at APEC in Bali. He talked about uh, moving uh, building mutual political trust, building political foundations toward bridging the cross-strait divide. And then several months later, in a conversation with uh, on, uh, KMT honorary chairman, Lian Zhen, uh, she uh, talked about, uh, he affirmed the 1992 consensus as the basis for deeper relations across the strait. And he also at that meeting indicated that he would be open-minded, I forget the precise language, but uh, he would be open-minded about exchanges with DPP leaders who were willing uh, to promote cross-strait relations. And on the basis of the 1992 consensus, uh, there, were, uh, there was considerable uh, progress made or considerable, uh, there were considerable new developments in the area of, of uh, 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 in an effort to build political ties, including uh, the uh, inaugural visit by a sitting uh, mainland affairs uh, chairman to China, which uh, initiated a, a series of exchanges between uh, the Taiwan uh, Affairs Office and uh, the MAC uh, on both sides of the strait and discussions between the two offices on things like the exchange of ARATS and Straits Exchange Foundation representative offices on either side of the Straits. And interestingly, meetings uh, between the Taiwan Affairs Office and the MAC included uh, negotiations and discussions on boosting economic uh, ties and moving forward on ECFA. Uh, other, other signs, um, unilaterally, uh, Xi Jinping reportedly or ordered uh, all Taiwan affairs units to propose specific measures to advance uh, cross-straits military trust-building measures uh, as a national research project. This is not something that the, that the Ma Ying-jeou administration uh, responded to positively. But all of this momentum toward the expansion of cross-strait ties and new directions uh, were disrupted practically as soon as they began uh, when in the spring of 2014, the Ma administration failed to deliver on the, the uh, services trade agreement amid uh, the sunflower protests in Taipei, which were largely directed at the lack of transparency in the legislative process, um, and they were led by students. And then subsequently, the Taiwan authorities uh, decided not to proceed with uh, ne negotiations on ARATS and, and Straits Exchange Foundation representation until the uh, Straits Trade, uh, sorry, the Services Trade Agreement was, was passed. This, uh, this disruption in the relationship has, I think, uh, been seen, uh, had, had, she has been palpably frustrated by this and has spoken uh, very firmly, drawing some very firm lines on China's views on the cross-strait relationship. During the Hong Kong uh, Occupy Central movement uh, in late September uh, last year, she chose to meet with pro-unification Taiwanese groups and to met any, at that meeting mentioned the one country, two systems formula for cross-strait relations, uh, a formulation that is anathema to the majority of Taiwanese citizens. And then in March 2015, uh, at a time when uh, Taiwan's presidential election started to heat, heat up. She spoke to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress on the Taiwan question and uh, identified Taiwanese independence as the biggest threat of cross-strait stability that should be resolutely opposed. 
And at the same meeting, he underscored the commitment, the need to stay committed to the 1992 consensus as, as both the basis and the precondition for exchanges with Taiwan and its political parties. And Xi has used other occasions since to underscore this point and, and the importance of the 1992 consensus uh, and to direct specific criticism against DPP-associated formulations such as one country on each side of the strait. But while Xi's rhetoric is harsh, uh, and he has used other methods as well to warn uh, the island about a pro independent stance, while uh, Tsai Ing-wen was speaking at CSIS, the PLA was conducting drills near Taiwan. Uh, but as the election approaches, and as it looks increasingly like uh, Taiwan will have a DPP uh, president, it's an, it's an election outcome that talking to Chinese experts who work on Taiwan that I think Chinese authorities are, are increasingly resigned to. The question is, is there any way that Beijing, is Beijing starting to think about how it might work with a Taipei that may not want to interact with Beijing on the basis of the 1992 consensus uh, in order to prevent the relationship from regressing and to preserve uh, the status quo? If you're optimistic, uh, you can look up and see some positive signs. Uh, it's clear that China has little trust for Tsai Ing-wen, uh, but it has uh, tried to build relations with members of the DPP party, actually facilitated by the DPP's own policies. And you've seen mayors from various uh, cities in Taiwan now, the majority of which are, are DPP, DPP party members. Uh, they visited uh, the mainland and have taken part in various exchanges. Um, the case that has drawn the most attention, of course, is the, the, the case of Mayor Ke uh, of Taipei. Uh, Ke questioned the 1992 consensus, saying he didn't know what it was. And that raised questions about whether he could uh, participate in the Shanghai, Taipei Shanghai or Shanghai Taipei Forum. Ultimately, the forum did take place, and, uh, and Ke went to Shanghai. Uh, but after he had indicated that he, quote unquote, respected the 1992 consensus and he acknowledged the importance of the existing political formulation to promoting cross-strait relations and peaceful cross-strait uh, cross relations uh, and made it clear that he did not see cross-strait uh, relations as international exchanges. Uh, he also later echoed a uh, remark that both uh, Xi and, and Li, have, Li Keqiang have made, saying that people on both sides of the strait are one family. Um, he received a fair amount of criticism for these comments in, in Taiwan, but a fair amount of praise in the mainland for his pragmatism and, and flexibility. Uh, and some uh, experts started talking about the Kowundra model uh, as a potential as, as, as a source of insights into how the two sides of the strait might uh, work together in a new DPP-led era. Many uh, Chinese experts that I've talked to said, have dismissed this idea and said there's no co-model. The 1992 consensus will remain the basis of cross-strait relations. It's the bottom line. But in any case, whether there is a co-model or not, uh, it seems like you can look at it as an effort to, to find some potential space for working with a DPP government. Um, and it's at least consistent with Xi's earlier statement that he'd be open to exchanges with DPP leaders who seek to promote cross-strait ties. Um, of course, this leaves open the question that Bonnie had mentioned of whether uh, the extent to which Tsai is uh, going to be pragmatic herself. If she wins by a very strong margin, uh, she may uh, take that as an endorsement of, of the DPP platform and, uh, and feel emboldened uh, to take an approach to cross-strait relations that is a lot less cautious on the pro-independence front, um, although that would depart from her commitment to the status quo. Uh, finally, and really quickly, let me just speculate, make a couple points about how China might pursue its reunification um, objectives post-election in addition to trying to find common ground with the DPP. First, uh, it's almost certainly going to place a lot more attention on cultural exchanges with Taiwan. A major concern for China about a DPP-led uh, government is that, it, that uh, Tsai will uh, uh, pick up on Chen Shui-bian's uh, Taiwanization agenda in the education area. Uh, 
preserving the Chinese part of Taiwan's identity is going to be a very important uh, goal of the, of the mainland. Uh, China is also going to try to keep providing incentives to important contingency, the Taiwanese business leaders, uh, including through traditional party-to-party -party ties, and to continue to foster exchanges, I think, with local level leaders, whatever their party background. Um, second, China has been pretty conservative about the way that it has constrained uh, Taiwan's international space uh, since Ma came to office, and it's all relative. But there is uh, speculation uh, that uh, failure to make progress by ECFA by the next administration is going to have an impact on Taiwan's participation in other regional economic integration initiatives, uh, including PPP and, and, and RCEP. Uh, whether that will be a Chinese policy isn't clear, but it's clear that China would not be supportive of Taiwan's participation. It seems clear that China's likely, and, and some Chinese experts have suggested that China is unlikely to support uh, Taiwan's participation in those efforts. So um, let me just wrap up. So to, I think uh, just to, to summarize, she came in with a very ambitious agenda to work with the KMT-led government to make cross-strait ties uh, more robust than they have been historically. Ties have come very far, but they've fallen short of Xi's cross-strait dream. And I think uh, the reality of Taiwan's electoral politics mean the opportunity that Xi saw in a Guomindang-led government is going to have passed. So if you're a pessimist, you focus on Xi's hard line. If you're an optimist, you're going to focus on every little early sign of potential pragmatism uh, on the Chinese side. I'll stop there. That was fantastic observation that Beijing is thinking about pragmatic way to cope with the elective Taiwanese uh, government. So I see there are Chinese media mm -hmm. and some other uh, China experts that who might be able mm -hmm. to take, uh, share with us their mm -hmm. take uh, during the Q&A session. Um, so uh, our next speaker, Meredith Miller, uh, AKA Mi Le Er. I just double check with her, the Chinese name. Uh, and uh, she will provide from the uh, Southeast Asian's perspective and then explain the implication of Taiwanese elections to the Southeast Asian countries. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. I mean, I should say I don't speak Chinese, so I'm just taking Nike's word for it that that is my Chinese name, and I'm happy to, to have it. Um, it was many published. Thanks. <laughs> Many thanks to the Atlantic Council um, for having me here for this very interesting discussion. I've already learned quite a bit um, from the preceding speakers. Um, I'm actually going to start out by saying that um, you know earlier we were talking before the panel about how the Taiwan elections have not received a very high level of attention yet in policy circles here in the US. And that is equally true in Southeast Asia at this time. Um, just for a little bit of context, there are some major political events happening through out the ASEAN region. We have elections coming up on September 11th in Singapore, a historic election in Myanmar in November, a party congress in Vietnam in January, elections in the Philippines in May, um, not to mention a huge political scandal um, involving the Prime Minister of Malaysia and ongoing military rule in Thailand. And on top of all that, um, Bonnie mentioned how deeply impacted Taiwan has been from China's economic slowdown. Um, that's equally true for Southeast Asia. Um, many and uh, most of the countries in the region have um, been hit hard by that, as well as falling commodity prices and the recent depreciation of the renminbi. So there's a lot of uh, issues demanding attention within each country's own borders, um, and this has not yet risen very high on the radar. Um, that as attention picks up here um, in the news cycle, I think that will also be the case in Southeast Asia. Um, there was uh, just last month a delegation uh, that the DPP put together um, that went on an 11-day uh, tour to some of the key countries in the region to help raise awareness about the DPP and the upcoming elections. Um, and we're starting to see a little bit more of a focus. Um, and Taiwan is certainly a very important partner for Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asian countries care very deeply about the status of cross-strait relations. So I'm going to keep my remarks brief and just uh, focus broadly on 
regional stability, which is the first basket of concerns um, that I would lay out for Southeast Asia, and the second being uh, regional economic integration, which has also been touched on already in this discussion. So first, in terms of regional stability, um, for Southeast Asian countries, um, peace and stability in the region is of paramount concern, and particularly um, relations between the U.S. and China. So within this context, um, the health and stability of cross-strait relations is very important. Um, and Southeast Asian policymakers, too, I think sometimes have a longer memory um, than we do here in our own capital. And when they are focused on this, they will be thinking back to the peak of tensions in the Chen Shui-bin administration um, when cross-straits relations um, really became an issue that were difficult for many countries in the region to juggle. Um, in one respect, I think we saw during that period sometimes miscalculations in terms of how sensitive China would be to Southeast Asians' engagements um, with Taiwan. Um, one example of this uh, is in 2004, um, then Deputy Prime Min Minister uh, Lee from Singapore, who is the son of the recently deceased uh, founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, and now Prime Minister, um, went on a trip to Taipei um, that was focused on economic issues, but he did meet with Chen Shui-bin while he was there. And Singapore was really caught off guard by the magnitude of China's response to the, the visit at the time, which included not only public criticism of Lee Sin Lung, um, but also of Singapore and the cancellation of several high-level visits, and basically put the relationship into a deep freeze for a while. Um, they'll also be remembering the way tensions played out in international organizations between, for example, in the WHO or in the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, where Southeast Asian countries often found themselves um, in the crosshairs of cross-strait relations, uh, particularly uh, between the U.S. and China. Um, the United States remains a very important security partner for most of the countries in the region and also an important economic partner. And China's economic importance uh, to Southeast Asia has only continued to grow since 2008 when President Ma came into office. Um, so this is a kind of situation that countries in the region would uh, just as soon avoid. Um, the other issue that relates to regional stability that maybe I'll table and we can return to in the discussion is the South China Sea. Again, since 2008, uh, we've seen, but in a less positive sense, we've seen a ratcheting up of tensions in the South China Sea, um, where several uh, Southeast Asian countries have uh, territorial claims that are overlapping with China's. <clears throat> um, to date, uh, the KMT's uh, claims in that area have been pretty much indistinguishable from mainland China's. Um, but there have been some early indications that perhaps the DPP will think about um, defining in a different way um, what China's claim is in the South China Sea. And also a few statements from DPP um, talking specifically about the importance of using the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to settle the disputes. Um, so this is another area where I think Southeast Asian policymakers will be watching closely any st new statements um, uh, from Madam Tsai if she uh, does become the winner of the next election. And this could be seen in, in two lights. I think many ASEAN countries would welcome a greater emphasis on using legal tools to settle the disputes through UNCLOS. Um, but they'll also be wary of any moves that could uh, deepen cross-strait tensions or perhaps cause further instability um, in the contested areas in the South China Sea. Um, the second core area that I'm going to address uh, is regional economic integration. Um, we've already heard how um, concerned Taiwan has been about being uh, relatively isolated from the proliferation of trade agreements that we've seen happen throughout Asia. Um, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has really tried to position itself as a leader of regional economic integration efforts. Um, this is happening primarily through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which is an effort to knit together ASEAN's bilateral FTAs with key dialogue partners, which include uh, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and India. Um, Taiwan has expressed an interest in joining RCEP, um, both the KMT and the DPP. And I think um, for ASEAN, looking at the economic relationship, Taiwan's a very important partner. It's the seventh largest trading partner 
um, for ASEAN. Um, in turn, for Taiwan, ASEAN is its second largest export market, um, but far behind uh, the first, which is China. And it makes a lot of sense from an economic perspective to have Taiwan be a party to this agreement. Um, but a condition for doing that would be to first negotiate an FTA with ASEAN, um, and the second would be to have the agreement of the other um, parties to the negotiation. Um, this would obviously be um, very difficult, if not impossible, without China's um, tacit support for progress moving forward. Um, Taiwan did sign a free trade agreement with uh, Taiwan in 2013, which is its first with an ASEAN country, and was really touted as being economically as well as strategically significant, perhaps um, laying a path forward for an ASEAN-wide agreement. Um, but thus far, we've seen um, very little movement on, on this particular front. Um, maybe I'll just leave things there, but I, I, I do want to say that I think also um, one of the reasons this may not be receiving as much attention right now is that um, cross-strait relations have been relatively relaxed which has allowed a lot more space um, for the, the relationship between Taiwan and ASEAN, but also individual ASEAN members. Um, and I do think that probably when the elections happen, um, there's going to be a lot of attention and focus really on reactions from China. I think that there is a sense um, in talking to people before this discussion um, from the region that um, Madam Tsai is not going to be provocative, that she is um, going to have an emphasis on, on maintaining balance in the cross-strait relations. But what people are less certain of is, um, and as Carlos said, is China's reaction. So that's going to be very important um, for ASEAN, and they'll be paying very close attention to that. Great. That was Thank great. Um, Mary, that's because uh, the South China Sea issue is one of the hottest issue. And then uh, we remember uh, Taiwan also claimed sovereignty on um, uh, areas of disputed islands. Yes. Yes. Our next speaker is uh, Bob, Bob Manning, um, AKA Manning. <laughs> I would say that Bob is in a very good place today because he is a uh, one He was, uh, he is surrounded by many Zishan <laughs> Manning beauties <laughs> with the seniority. <laughs> So Bob will uh, explain from the perspective of the Northeast Asia, and then uh, explain to us the political implications of Taiwanese election to Japan and Korea. Bob. Okay, well I think uh, Northeast Asia, particularly Japan, and to some lesser extent Korea, is more a little different from Southeast Asia. They're more kind of on the front lines as in, in the event of crisis or tensions. Um, and I want to make a couple of points just on context. And I think one way to think about it is that uh, the worst fear of just about every Asian country is having to choose between the US and China. And, and that's what a Taiwan crisis would evoke. Um, I think the, <clears throat> the, second, the second contextual point, this applies to both Japan and, and Korea, is that it's, an, it's a strange feature of Asia Pacific, that there's a kind of a, what I've called two Asias, that you have a whole pattern of growing economic integration, and in security you have growing confrontation, growing military spending, and growing tension. And how that, I think that, that captures a lot of the, the issue. Uh, I, what I'm going to talk about is, is a, a rise in tensions, because I, I think that we're likely, I, or let me say I won't be at all surprised, if, if, uh, if we see a rise in tensions. You're going to have uh, a new government in Taiwan that I think the Chinese are reconciled at the DPP. They're going to have to live with. Then a about a year after that, they're going to have a new, new US government. And I think China historically has always tried to test new presidents. So that's something you have to worry about. Um, and then the third point would be uh, just based on what Xi Jinping has said so far, which is not much, but there are two potentially troubling things. The, the, big, the big statement he made on Taiwan was, we can't, you know, we're not in a rush, we do things gradually, but we can't wait forever. Uh, that's one. And the second one that I think is much more troubling to Taiwan was he keeps talking about Hong Kong as a one-country, two, one, one two-systems model, 
And in Taiwan, especially particularly after the uh, umbrella revolutions in Hong Kong, I think Ta Taiwan is looking at much more like one country, one and a half systems, and doesn't want any part of it. And, and that's where I think you may get a buildup of tension, because I think uh, under the Ma uh, government in, in Taiwan, I think Taiwan and the cross-straits relations have gone about as far as they can. We've seen a backlash that's been talked about on the economic front. I think there's zero support for any kind of political or security uh, movement uh, with, with the mainland in Taiwan. So the question is, is, is Xi Jinping content to live with the status quo? Because I do think both China and the DPP both learned lessons from the Shen Shui Bian uh, government in terms of uh, how to deal with each other. Uh, so so that, that's one thing. Now, in, in terms of Japan, um, they're really on the front line because uh, in the, they have a troubled relationship with, with China. Uh, a lot of tension and, and confrontation over the uh, Senkakus or the Daiutai, as the Chinese call it, islands in the East China Sea. Uh, that seems to have calmed down a little bit, but the Chinese have, have pushed it uh, very far. There are more Japanese jets scrambling in the last year over the, over the East China Sea than any time in the last several years. Uh, so you, ha you have that. And, um, and of course, you know, the, the, for the Communist Party of China, there's two pillars of legitimacy. One is uh, econo delivering economically, which is increasing, increasingly in question. And the other is nationalism. And a lot of the uh, Jap Chinese nationalism is, is kind of an anti-Japan nationalism. So uh, I think what we're seeing, though, uh, and this was evident in uh, Korean President Park when she attended the 70th anniversary uh, parade and got Xi Jinping to agree to a trilateral summit with Japan, uh, was it's, it's kind of moving into a more <coughs> stabilizing role. And what we're seeing is a kind of bifurcated China-Japan relationship that uh, China, Japanese investment in China has been down about 40% since 2012 when they had these anti-Japanese riots. And I think that the Chinese want to uh, want to get Japanese investment given the state of their economy. So I think you're seeing more economic cooperation and, uh, and some level of, of tension over the, uh, the East China Sea. Um, in the event of, and of, of a crisis, I think you know, if, the, if, if there was any confrontation, the US forces de deployed to support Taiwan would most likely come from Japan initially. And, and similarly, we have a two X-band radars in Japan. If any missiles started firing across uh, the straits uh, from the mainland, that, that might come into play uh, as, as well. Uh, so, you, so you have this compl complex relationship. And I think if you took a poll in Japan, if, should the Japan support the US in a conflict with Taiwan, I think the majority would probably say no. Um, if Abe is prime minister, I think the answer would probably be yes. But if, if, if something happened in a post-Abe administration, I think it's more ambiguous how the Japanese would respond uh, to a crisis. Um, in terms, let me just say a few words about uh, Korea. And that's an even more complicated relationship because, as you know, uh, Korea is also a divided country, although they, they, they I've always wondered why they don't raise it more with the Chinese, because China plays an important role in why Korea is still divided, but because of its uh, support for North Korea. Uh, and and uh, so there you, have, you have that. And then in, in Korea, the same thing you have. Korea has become, uh, China's become the number one uh, export market for Korea, their number one trading partner. and. Uh, President Park, who speaks very good Chinese and has a very good relationship with, with uh, Xi Jinping, has really solidified uh, relations. That the, uh, the Koreans uh, are very concerned about North, where North Korea is going. And, and uh, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been an unprecedented debate in China about whether North Korea is, is an asset or a liability. And there's a lot of very fair, unusually prominent Chi uh, Chinese, including several uh, not so retired generals saying they're 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 not they're not an asset uh, and we have to dump them, but I think 
the bottom line is China has uh, decided it's more afraid of instability or chaos in, in North Korea or collapse than it is about nuclear weapons or anything else. And, and I think the cost to China in providing food and fuel to North Korea is, is low enough that uh, they're going to keep doing that. So, so you, you have that dimension of it. And I think the Koreans are also looking to China as a moderating force. I mean, there's probably a reason we haven't had a North, another North Korean missile or uh, nuclear test, although I think we, we probably will see in the next couple of months a North Korean ICBM test. It wouldn't surprise me at all. They appear to be making some preparations. So on, for Korea, if you have a rise in tensions, I think, I think they would uh, make a, a gargantuan effort to stay neutral uh, and not, not get involved. And I think they'd be very concerned about the, China, the U.S. trying to push them into, into a role. Um, right now, they are debating uh, what, what kind of missile defense system they want. And I think that the trend lines seem to be increasingly towards integrating with the the U.S. Uh, X-band radar system with Japan, uh, which would provide the best protection against um, a North Korean attack. The Chinese have, have overplayed their hand badly with the Koreans on uh, missile defense. There was an open statement by a Chinese, visiting Chinese uh, senior general telling them not to, not, to get, not to buy the THAAD. And I think uh, the, the Chinese have falsely claim that this, this is a threat to them. But uh, the, the US missile defense system um, in no way affects their second strike retaliatory capability. I think what the Chinese are more upset about is trilateral cooperation between US, Korea, and Japan. And so they leaned on the Koreans uh, on that. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave it there. We can pick up any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, so as a moderator, I will be uh, proactive and then take the liberty uh, to ask the very first question. Uh, we heard the panelists talking about uh, uh, one, uh, uh, the 92 consensus. And then the buzz wordings from the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, is bu lao, di do, um, Dong uh, Shan Yao, which means uh, which which brought a lot of uh, discussions and debates. Uh, it means that if the um, there was no solid foundation, uh, then the Earth and if there was no solid foundation of the 92 consensus, then the Earth and the mountain is, are, are moving. So I wonder, in two weeks, in September 25, if I remember correctly, uh, Xi Jinping is coming to the White House to have a st state visit. How do you expect the Taiwan uh, election to be raised and discussed during his visit here? Uh, thank you. Uh, but you know, I think that every Chinese leader, when he meets with an American counterpart, raises Taiwan. Uh, in recent years, uh, my understanding is that has been relatively perfunctory, uh, mostly because China has felt that it's been able to manage the relationship with Taiwan by itself. Uh, I doubt, actually, that uh, this time around that it will be very different. I think there's an enormous number of far more pressing issues between the United States and China uh, that are on the agenda. And frankly, limited time between the two presidents. 30 hours, uh, we a, uh, Well, uh, 30 hours probably includes uh, uh, all of the events, right? So uh, that means the, uh, the uh, ceremony on the South Lawn, uh, the state dinner, the luncheon uh, at the State Department. Uh, there will be two opportunities for in-depth discussion, one in the uh, dinner the prior evening uh, when he arrives, and then uh, one the following day uh, with some other, of course, number of people in the room. So I would be surprised if Xi does not raise it, because I think that this is something that uh, Chinese leaders always want to lay down a marker. This time, I would guess that Xi Jinping's uh, message uh, will be uh, that uh, the United States should uh, try to play a more proactive role mm -hmm. to ensure that cross-strait stability exists and that in order to have cross-strait stability, that there must be an acceptance by Taiwan's next president of the 1992 consensus and more importantly, one China. 
uh, and uh, that the U.S. should play a role in ensuring that that happens. Uh, but I, I doubt it would be a prolonged uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. I think we'll hear more from China after the election. Mm -hmm. And at this particular juncture in time, I think there are just far more uh, important and really urgent issues that the two presidents will want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that they are, being, they are having self-control not to say too much on this because they don't want to affect, influence the outcome one way or the other? You mean the United States no, or the, the Chinese? China, 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 I'm sure the, the Chinese China. would be very happy to influence the outcome if they could. <laughs> I don't think that, uh, that they actually think they can this time around. Though the Chinese are worried about one issue that uh, Carla raised, and that is the margin of victory uh, that Tsai Ing-wen mm -hmm. might have. Uh, they are quite concerned about a very large mandate and the potential fracturing of the KMT. They want to see the KMT remain an effective counterbalance mm -hmm. minority party that could restrain uh, the DPP and Tsai Ing-wen as president, and also within uh, the legislative UN. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, getting the U.S. to uh, really get seriously involved at this point, I think, is not really uh, very much on uh, on the on the agenda. I think this will wait until after the elections, and then there will be probably more discussions. Um, and it will, they will not just be initiated by the mainland side. They will be initiated by the Obama administration mm -hmm. that already is encouraging the Chinese to be more creative and flexible, mm -hmm. uh, just as they are encouraging the other side in Taiwan <laughs> to be creative and flexible. Yeah, I guess we should have a, another seminar on 2016, January <laughs> after the election here, right here. So uh, Carla, what do you think? What, can you tell us what's in Xi Jinping's mind. <laughs> if I could, <laughs> that would be fantastic. I, I, I can't, and in fact, uh, China watching has become more difficult than ever, partly because it's very hard to understand uh, Xi Jinping, I think, uh, and we're still figuring that out. Uh, I, I, I know some commentators have said that they would hope that the U.S. would make some sort of statement, uh, expect the U.S. to make some kind of statement uh, make, uh, committing, making a statement of commitment to the one China uh, policy uh, as part of the uh, part of formal remarks. I'm not sure. I, I tend to agree with with Bonnie. I think that uh, there will certainly be a discussion here. Uh, this is very much on Xi Jinping's mind, but it's it's uh, it's always on his mind talking about uh, U.S.-China relations. But there there are, are a, an array of other issues that need to get covered and addressed, including some that are more positive for the relationship. And I think that that both leaders want to come out with a, with some some positive. Uh, dividends from this from this exchange. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So looking around, I saw a very knowledgeable crowd here. So I will stop here and open the floor to the Q&A session. Um, so uh, would you, if you could please tell me, tell us your name, your affiliation, and then if there is any specific uh, speaker you would like to address your question to, that would be great. Um, first, I will go from the front row. Uh, Garrett? Hey, uh, my name is Garrett Van der Wees. I'm editor of Taiwan Communique, a uh, publication here in DC. Uh, both Bonnie and Meredith, you referred to the statement by Tsai Ing-wen that she doesn't uh, intend to provoke, to have provocative uh, policies. Uh, and together with the DPP office, we actually coordinated her visit to DC uh, back in uh, early June. And in talking with her, she is very serious on that point. Uh, not to provoke China, but on the other hand, they don't want to be bullied into submission in a sense and undermine uh, Taiwan's hard-won uh, democracy. So the question is really, does China intend to pursue provocative policies? If you look at China's track record, South China Sea, East China Sea, the answer is basically very clearly no. Uh, so shouldn't we uh, basically lean on China and uh, try to put a burden on them to show that it can be, as Bonnie said, flexible and, and more creative uh, to accept Taiwan as a friendly neighbor. That would be a very stable long-term position instead of trying to uh, cling to 92 consensus, which is a very vague, uh, vague formulation. Bob? 
Well, I think, I think uh, as I said, I, I, I expect to see some level of rise in tensions. But there are a couple of important issues where the Chinese could be creative. One being TPP is that Taiwan is a member economy of APEC. And uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't be allowed to uh, join TPP if they can abide by the standards that are going to be agreed to, if, presuming we get TPP. Uh, and then the other one is the Asian Investment Bank. Uh, there was an initial back and forth, and the Taiwan indicated an interest, and the Chinese said, didn't say no, they said not now. <coughs> and um, I, think, I think those are two things that the Chinese could use to try to get more cooperation from a DPP government as, as leverage. I don't know if they'll be creative enough to do that, but those are things I, I look for. Anyone on the panel would like to add a point? Okay, I, um, I'm taking another question from the left, the gentleman uh, from the second row. Thank you, I'm uh, Tom Reckford with the Malaysia America Society and the Foreign Policy Discussion Group. Um, on the South China Sea, I wonder if any, if the presidential candidates in Taiwan have made any comments about the China, Chinese buildup on some of the islets and reefs, uh, and whether uh, Taiwan has commented at all about the uh, judicial efforts of the Philippines uh, to press China, and Vietnam's also uh, forceful efforts to uh, affect China's policy. Yes. So, uh, the, the position of the uh, Taiwan government under Ma Ying-jeou uh, is uh, to try and reduce uh, tensions in the South China Sea, and he has put forward this uh, concept of the uh, South China Sea Peace Initiative. Um, he has supported uh, the application of international law uh, and not said anything uh, to criticize, in particular, <clears throat> the Philippines uh, taking its case to the uh, permanent uh, court at The Hague. But Taiwan's main concern has, in fact, been that the Philippines' case rests on the fact that none of the land features in the Spratleys could be considered islands. That is, the most they could be would be rocks that at most get 12 nautical miles territorial sea. Now, Taiwan, of course, occupies the largest of the natural land features, um, what we call you know, Ituab or Taiping Island. And so on uh, July 7th, the Taiwan government released a rather lengthy statement uh, taking the position that Taiping Island is an island, that it, under the definition and unclose, that it should be entitled to a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. Now, whether or not the Permanent Court in The Hague, the Arbitral Tribunal, will rule on this uh, particular point of the case is open to question anyway. But I think that that was really Taiwan's main concern. Um, but it does want to use, I think, the fact that there are heightened tensions in the region to try and create a role for Taiwan. You know, Taiwan has been excluded from the talks between China and ASEAN on the code of conduct, would very much like to participate, believes it, uh, it has a stake and it has the right since it actually occupies um, uh, two islands in the, uh, in the South China Sea, the Pratas being in the north. Uh, so uh, this is, um, I think that this is something that uh, Taiwan's uh, government has spoken out uh, quite a bit. The candidates, far less so. Um, and Tsai Ing-wen has certainly said that she would like to handle the, the issue according to law, but it is unclear um, what that would really mean if she would become president. So because uh, uh, it's very likely we'll have a female uh, Taiwanese president, so why don't we go to a lady? Uh, the lady's question, uh, Iris. Hi, Iris Shaw from the DPP US Mission. Thank you, panelists, for all this very uh, valuable insight, a lot of fruit for thought for our party to um, take back. Uh, uh, my question could be for any one of it. Uh, the DPP is committed to the vital partnership with the US. Uh, 
principled uh, in cooperation with China and economic maintaining economic aut autonomy as well as trade di diversification. Uh, also participating in the international projects, uh, not just the international organizations uh, where Taiwan could contribute. Uh, so I'd like to uh, learn from, pick your brain on what could uh, the, the U.S.-Taiwan relationship be going forward uh, next year. Uh, that's Susan Thornton has said the U.S. administration has worked to reconceptualize and reinstitutionalize the relationship. So I'd like to uh, Know where? What do you think about all these four baskets of area? And if I may respond to uh, Bonnie's uh, uh, last comment on uh, not sure what the, the DPP will do with the pork and beef issue, uh, our uh, chief economic advisors have been here at the end of May. Uh, they were well received by the U.S. Uh, counterparts, and they, they definitely thought. Uh, long and hard on the beef and pork issues as well as uh, other trade, bilateral trade, international trade issue with the U.S. administration. So uh, I think uh, we can all stay tuned for their economic policy to roll out. Yeah, so the U.S. policy. Uh, well, I, this is not an issue that I follow particularly closely, but I think uh, there are opportunities for the U.S. to uh, work with uh, some of the T TPP partners uh, to work with Taiwan. Right now, uh, Taiwan's efforts to uh, move forward with FTAs with uh, some of the countries in uh, Southeast Asia have, have, and India as well have faltered, uh, and in part because of uh, some assume uh, pressure from China. Uh, it would be helpful for the U.S. to support uh, negotiations, bilateral negotiations between countries that are members of the TPP, perhaps as as a, uh, as a preparation for eventual uh, Taiwan participation in that regional agreement. Mm -hmm. So, Mary, that used to work for uh, State Department. Uh, would you like to? Yeah, with Bob. <laughs> with Bob. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, what yeah, was the do question? You, do you want to respond to Ira's question on uh, how is the uh, U.S. going to uh, continue the policy while keeping uh, both the national interest mm -hmm. and the uh, stability of the core threat in perspective? Do you want mm -hmm. anything to I, add? Sure, but I will defer to all the China and Taiwan experts on the panel since my main focus is Southeast Asia. Bob, want to say something? Well, I, I guess one thing I would say is I, I think um, I think the U.S. would be open to a trade agreement with Taiwan, but Taiwan has some problems with protectionist policies that have been an impediment. So I think the ball is really kind of in, in, in Taiwan's court on, on that. If the DPP comes up with more uh, fr free trade uh, approach, I think that, that, that something could happen uh, quite easily. Okay. Um, do we have more questions? We move to the gentleman. So the gentleman from the first row. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Bonnie, my questions to you. Uh, you really touched on it right at the end of your remarks. And I'm, I'm sorry, Scott Harold from the Rand Corporation. Um, you touched on at the end of your remarks. If the KMT goes down in flames, which it looks like Ms. Hong may. There's a fear within the KMT, I understand, that she may drag the rest of the KMT down. You touched on that a little bit in the sense that they may lose the LY. You saw last week Ms. Hong suspended her campaign. There's rumors that she did so to try to prevent uh, the cabinet from resigning and trying to change the date of the LY elections so that the members who might lose on her short coattails would not lose. What happens if the KMT really implodes after an election that brings Dr. Tsai to power. Who, who wins within the KMT? Who really loses? Obviously, Eric Chu could take a lot of the blame for not having run and for not having present, prevented Ms. Chu from running. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms., uh, Ms. Hong from running. But who's the winner within the KMT? And then, if I could, ask you to speculate, what would China do if the KMT really implodes and there's no check? that's probably much more dangerous for cross-strait relations and may not even be to the DPP's benefit insofar as it may raise the willingness of Beijing to say, well, there's just no hope now. Softball question. 
you paint a very dire picture, Scott. Um, <laughs> and I hope it won't be that bad. Uh, but even in many countries where we have had really far-reaching losses uh, by a, a, a party, they reinvigorate themselves, they bring in new blood, they uh, adopt new policies, and over time become stronger, or other parties are formed. Uh, some of the people leave the party and they form other parties. In the case of Taiwan, of course, that might take a little bit of time, and the, and the interim period uh, could be very worrisome to the mainland. Um, also, to some extent, to the United States, if that were to happen. I think, ultimately, the, the, the health of any democracy means that you need to have a, a good political debate, um, and you do need checks and balances. Uh, so I think that the US hopes that there will be a, a number of political parties, not just one that's in Taiwan. Um, it's easier for me to see the losers than it is to see the winners. Uh, and the KMT has been so dominated by the older generation and so, so reluctant to allow in uh, the younger people that it's really hard to see who the up and coming people are. And so many of us had really anticipated that Eric Jew eventually would get into the race. I myself really thought eventually it, it was just a question of timing. But clearly, that was not, not correct. Uh, but I think he would be a loser if, if the KMT really implodes, uh, that, that because he is the chair of, of the party. Um, but I'm, I think there's a lot of very bright young people in Taiwan. Uh, there are people who are in politics or people who are not yet in politics um, who would ultimately form new parties or, or reinvigorate the KMT uh, from within. It's just that it would take time. The old uh, political ways of doing things in Taiwan, maybe they have to change. And the people at the top have been very reluctant to make those changes. That was a very good point. So uh, let's see. I think I saw one gentleman over there. Hello, Eric Gomez from the Cato Institute. Um, I was wondering what kind of impact does US defense commitments to Taiwan have on the Taiwanese political um, political parties in general, but also in particular the presidential election. And following on that, how do the youth view the American commitment? Do they see it as something that is very stable and it's going to be there for a long time? Or are they taking more of a we have to look out for ourselves approach? Thank you. So uh, Bonnie or uh, Carla? Like, <laughs> <I'm not liking. laughs> well, you just remind me of a um, State Department uh, during a the briefing. They do mention that the uh, U.S. commitment to Taiwan is not changed, and then they do not have any plan, or uh, they they have not be, been uh, planning to review its uh, uh, policy toward Taiwan. Uh, that said, um, I did heard that uh, there are some articles on. Uh, on that, uh, if Tsai Ing-wen uh, was elected as a president, then um, the 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 tendency of a um, instability may trigger some worries in the United States. But I would like to forward that uh, to Carla. Mm -hmm. Would you like to respond to his question? Well, I mean, I, I haven't talked, I don't, I can't talk about the, t the response of the Taiwanese youth to this issue. I think it's a very important question. I, I think that the U.S. government's uh, pattern, recent uh, pattern in terms of arms sales to Taiwan has set, sent a clear message that there is no blank check uh, and the Taiwanese are, are aware of that. Uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, Premier, premier uh, security guarantor of Taiwan is the U.S. and the, and young people uh, continue to to view that that way. The mood, though, in Taiwan, I think, is of frustration, frustration and a and a desire for uh, a stronger Taiwan that can act more independently. And I think, um, in talking with at least the limited my limited pool of students, there's a lot of frustration that the U.S. hasn't done more to support Taiwan expand its international space. Uh, and on, on that level, uh, Taiwanese students feel that we have not served their futures very well. 
uh, they have limited, more limited options in the world. Uh, I work in an international relations school. These are people who historically would have been diplomats, served in multilateral institutions. They don't have those options. Uh, so that's a great source of frustration. So if I could just um, add to that. It's unfortunate that they blame the United States. Mm -hmm. It's really not our fault. Mm -hmm. There's only so much the U.S. can do to help fix that Taiwan's international space. And I actually think that the United States has worked pretty hard um, in support of mm -hmm. Taiwan. And you can cite many uh, examples where we have helped, uh, helped Taiwan. Uh, but ultimately, uh, for better or worse, it is uh, just a fact that the mainland is increasingly powerful. Mm -hmm. It has a great deal of influence over the choices of other countries and the choices of international uh, organizations. Uh, and uh, China is, I think, going forward, going to be um, less willing to allow Taiwan's uh, participation, uh, even in the case where we have seen a better cross-strait relationship. Uh, there have been very, very few breakthroughs in international space mm -hmm. under Ma Ying-jeou's ten tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, the World Health Assembly and uh, a, you know, attendance at uh, the International mm -hmm. Civil, Civil Aviation Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that's, uh, that it, it is unfortunate, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that the U.S. has the magic wand here that can solve it. Mm -hmm. and, and the defense issues, my, my sense is that uh, the majority of people in Taiwan do not sense a, a a great military threat from mainland China. This is not something that's talked about on a daily basis in Taiwan. Um, certainly the military knows, the intelligence community knows, but it's not highlighted. Uh, so that said, of course, people in Taiwan see the United States as, a, as a, a, an important security partner um, and want to constantly be reassured that the United States is going to be there if, uh, if Taiwan faces a threat. But I don't think that defense issues are uh, in the top three on the minds of most people living in, in Taiwan. And some of these other issues I talked about earlier, mostly pertaining to the economy, opportunities for young people, um, mm -hmm. job-wise, for example. Uh, you know, Taiwan produces an enormous number of people coming out of college with degrees that then they can't use to get jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a mismatch between the education provided and uh, the kind of uh, job opportunities that exist. I think this is what the youth really cares about. Uh, uh, but of course, at the level of elites and the government and the military, there is always a desire in Taiwan to see symbols of commitment from the United States. And that can come in so many forms, whether it's a speech by a US official like Susan Thornton, um, or maybe a comment by the president, uh, or a transit, as we had mm -hmm. by President uh, Ma Ying-jeou uh, recently, and potentially maybe another arms sale. One mm -hmm. could take place before the end of, uh, the, another one could take place before the end of this administration. So I think all of these are also seen as just important signals of the continuing important close relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan. Uh, there, ha there haven't been a major arms um, sale announcement in years, and I heard that, um, uh, I just want to echo what Bonnie was saying, that people are expecting there might be one coming before the end of the Obama administration. I would say that after this panel, there will be a, a U.S. Taiwan Business Council con a press conference, and they have an annual uh, military, uh, they, will, they will have an annual conference and I will expect that to be discussed, so stay tuned. We have uh, questions from the Chinese media, this gentleman. Thank you uh, My name is Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. My name is for Bonnie. You mentioned that uh, it's unlikely provocative policy toward China. And, but I also heard uh, some concerns from the Chinese experts. Uh, they said uh, Tsai Ing-wen uh, is uh, fickle. And maybe with the political momentum in Taiwan changing, uh, she will change her policy. They raised the case of Chen Shui-bian. Uh, at the very beginning, when he took the office, he was modest. He was uh, low-key. But just within uh, one or two years, he was changing. So it will happen again this time. How confident you are to predict that Tsai Ing-wen won't change 
her policy, will keep the policy stable in her four or even eight year if she is elected. Thank you. So this is an interesting dynamic process, and I would certainly urge people on the mainland to do an in-depth study as to why Chen Shui-bian changed his policies, right? Um, this wasn't because he had some deep desire uh, to be a you know, pro-independence provocative uh, leader. That's my view. Uh, I think that uh, mainland's policies towards Taiwan uh, made Chen Shui-bian very frustrated and pushed him to go in a more radical direction. The mainland should really draw some lessons from that period when they think about how they are going to manage Tsai Ing-wen. But you do make a point about Beijing's mistrust of Tsai Ing-wen. And this is something that is fact actually more serious than Chen Shui-bian. People on the mainland have done a lot of study of Tsai Ing-wen's past positions. Uh, now, we all evolve, and there's no reason to say that Tsai Ing-wen's positions are exactly the same as they were in the past. But yes, when she worked for Li Deng-hui, she was in uh, charge of a task proposed the two states theory. She served in Chen Shui-bian's administration when President Chen put forward the position of uh, one country on each side of the strait. Um, and she, in fact, st strongly discouraged Chen Shui-bian from accepting the 1992 consensus and said so publicly. Uh, and I think that the Chinese are very worried about her history. Uh, Chinese scholars often say Chen Shui-bian was an opportunist. Tsai ideologue. I don't accept that. But it, it represents to me how deeply suspicious they are of, of her. Now, that means that Tsai Ing-wen needs to do more to reassure the mainland. Uh, e even if these concerns are not valid, nevertheless, there is some responsibility on her side to provide some reassurances that she is not going to pursue these kinds of agendas that she has put forward in the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we have more time for one more question? I more? think we're done. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> right. uh, we started a little bit late, but we also ended a little bit late. I think a sign uh, of having a great panel and some great interest on, on the part of you all. So thank you very much. There's a lot of great experts uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm particularly proud that we have this group here to provide us uh, with an initial discussion on this issue and some different